Romans chapter 12. We've been in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 12. Our series has been on powerful living. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Two verses in that chapter. I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Why don't you stand with me, please, as we look at God's Word. The Bible says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray that we are living sacrifices. I pray that every person here at some point has trusted you as their Savior by inviting you into their heart in a simple prayer like, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Please be my Savior. The beauty of talking to you is you never misunderstand us. We don't have to say magic words. You know our heart. And however we express ourselves to you, you know us. We're thankful for that. Lord, this morning I pray also that every one of us have presented ourselves to you for your service. Whatever you want, we want to live for you. And that's what we'll be talking about this morning. I pray that we would understand it and follow it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Last few weeks we've been talking in the Sunday morning service from Romans chapter 8, and in the evening service, we've been doing a study on the Holy Spirit. I would encourage you, if you can, fit it into your schedule to come with us on Sunday evenings at 6 o'clock and look into God's Word as we're discussing the Holy Spirit, something that's very misunderstood in the Christian community, but clearly taught in the Bible. And you can't have powerful living, apart from knowing Christ as your personal Savior, and having the Holy Spirit fill you and control you. And those are resources that are available to us, and hopefully those two are connected together and and active in your life. In Romans chapter 7, if you're familiar with the book of Romans at all, we have that great paradox that goes on where the Apostle Paul talks about the things that he knows that he should do, he really struggles with, and the things that he should not do. Those are the things that he seems like he always finds himself doing, and, and we recognize the battle that goes on inside every life of the old man, the old flesh. The, the Bible, the Christian term is the old Adamic nature, that old sin nature of Adam. That's in us. And then we got that new person. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. And then there's that new person that's in you that Christ created in you. And those two people don't get along. Tonight I'll be talking about the power of the Holy Spirit, the struggle that goes on. And I've I've termed it draining the swamp. Because every one of us have swamps in our life that they don't drain easy. Romans chapter 7 talks about that struggle, and then we are in the world, but we're not of the world. We've been saved from the old nature and its sinfulness and look forward to the fact that we will live forever with Christ in glory. I'm saved from my past penalty of sin. I've been forgiven in Christ. I'm saved from the present power of sin over me. Sin doesn't grab me. Sin doesn't control me. If I sin, I choose it. If you sin, you choose it. Old Flip Wilson always used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil has no power over you. If you are struggling with sin in your life, it's because you're choosing to do so. Stan Griffin never sinned by accident. I'm not proud of this, but it's the truth. When I sin, I choose to. You do too. Don't look at me like that. Okay? Obviously... But sin has no power over us. Satan has no power over us. It's to the old nature that we're struggling with. I'm saved from the past penalty of sin. I'm saved from the present power of sin. And by God's grace and looking forward to being saved for eternity with him in glory. That's the salvation experience. You don't hope to get eternal life someday. If you know Christ, you have eternal life right now. That's not something we're looking forward to. We are experiencing that right now since you've trusted Christ as your Savior. He paid my price. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Don't forget that verse because we're going to come back to it. We have sung this morning. Mark mentioned it in his prayer over the offering. We have experienced grace and mercy. Okay? Grace is getting what I don't deserve. Say that with me. Grace is getting what I don't deserve. Chuck Swindell tells, Chuck Swindell tells the story. Several years ago, my family and I were enjoying an evening at a restaurant. We looked over in the corner and saw a couple from our church. We waved at them, and they winked back in our direction. Just before they left, they came by our table, shook hands, and said hi. When our meal was over, I got up and walked to the cash register and said, I didn't get a check for our meal. They said, oh, well, you don't have to worry about that because someone else paid for it. I asked, who paid for it? They said, well, we don't know who they are, but they were the couple that walked over and said hello to you. I was astonished, but said, well, why don't I take care of the tip? No, that was taken care of too. It was paid in full. He said, I had the hardest time accepting that gift. That's exactly what Christ has done for us. You and I, on the smorgasbord of the world, had feasted on things that were condemning us to death. Jesus Christ stepped in, and he paid our debt, tip and all. He covered it all. There's nothing else you need to do. Salvation is by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. All you have to do is accept it. It's the greatest thing ever. I don't know why everyone's not a Christian. Sad to say, because of pride, many people will refuse the gift, say, I don't need any free handout from anybody, and die and go to hell. That's the truth. That's the shame of it. We have experienced God's grace. I've gotten something I do not deserve. Mercy, we've also experienced mercy. Mercy is not getting what I do deserve. Mercy is not getting what I do deserve. Say that with me. Mercy is not getting what I do deserve. You and I deserve eternal punishment. But obviously, God has rescued us from that. Look at, if you're in Romans chapter 12, look with me at the last verse in Romans chapter 11. If you're using a pew Bible, we're on page 1206. The last verse is number 36. Romans 11:36 says, For of him... And through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. I've gotten grace. And because of him, I have all that I have. Through him, I am blessed and experiencing blessing. And to him, I owe all that I am. So what do I do? Now, remember, Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself... All of this is the grace and mercy and the salvation and all that I'm experiencing in Christ is all of the things that you and I get to have, all these things that he's done for us. Let's say you left church this morning and outside with a big bow on it is a Ford F-150, platinum, brand new, with your name on it. Free. My wife is saying my birthday is coming right up. It's for you. What would you? Who who did this? What can I do? I'm not kidding. If you feel so led, any one of you, folks, more than of course, Pete would want some Silverado thing or other. Whatever, you you name it, whatever it is, does not compare. All the golden fort, whatever, Bill Gates' money, Jeff Bates, anybody, you name it. Blank check, anything, nothing compares to what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross of Calvary. Grace and mercy and eternal life. You and I have not seen it yet, but I'm telling you, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for those that love him. You and I have incredible wealth in Christ. 
on reserve waiting for us for when we get there for all eternity. We will be singing his praises, walking around. There's no time in heaven, but the equivalent of thousands of years just saying, wow, 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 wow. Say it with me. Wow. It's going to be incredible. Nothing compares to it. And so you and I, if we're thinking about this at all, ought to be saying, what can I do? The Bible tells us, present yourself. Present yourself. We sing all that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory. That's exactly right. The NIV, if you have an NIV Bible this morning, Romans 12, 1 reads, Therefore I urge you, brothers... In view of God's mercy, a mother once approached Napoleon seeking a pardon for her son. The emperor replied that the young man had committed a certain offense twice, and justice demanded death. She said, but I don't ask for justice, the mother explained. I plead for mercy. But your son does not deserve mercy, Napoleon replied. Sir, the woman cried, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask for. Well, then the emperor said, I will have mercy. And he spared the woman's son. In view of God's mercy, present yourself. Say that with me. Present yourself. There are many motivations for applying for or joining certain establishments. There was an ad campaign that said, remember, membership has its privileges. I'm slightly offended by the next one, but I've gone to a point in my life where the AARP is calling quite a lot, (laughs) wanting me to join. That's not going to happen. But of course, they'll talk about all the things that you get by being a member. AAA is the same way. If you need a free toll. Well, whatever it is, you get the idea. But let me tell you something. You don't present yourself to God in Romans chapter 12 because of the things you can get in the future. You present yourself in Romans chapter 12 for what he's done for you in the past. You and I deserve nothing more. We've already gotten more than we deserve in benefits. And I notice in America today, and I'm, please don't, do not, I love our soldiers, I love our men in uniform. But there was a time where people joined the military because they loved their country and wanted to stand for it and the flag and all that it represented. Now it seems like, boy, they're all, boy, I'm going to join this because I'm going to get this, 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 and I'm going to get this. And I've noticed, and it's not just the military, please don't, I'm I'm probably going to, I've noticed that whatever we join now, it's generally for selfish reasons, not because it is a worthwhile cause. And I think the more and more godless we become as Americans, the more selfish our desires become. And you and I are seeing some of that. I don't step forward and present myself to Christ for what I'm hoping to get in the future. The picture of the presentation, present your bodies a living sacrifice, is taken from the Old Testament sacrifices. Old Testament theology required the presentation of a sacrifice. It had to be without blemish, perfect, fit for the Lord. It was a picture of of Christ's sacrificial, sinless death on the cross. Remember, we already quoted the verse. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Christ was perfect, and he was that perfect sacrifice. Now you and I are called to be a living sacrifice. The sacrifice of death has been paid by Jesus Now we are a picture of the life of Christ. Romans 8, remember, says there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ. So how do I present myself a living sacrifice? What's that look like? How how can I be a sacrifice? Well, I think Hebrews 13 teaches that. And if you'll go with me to Hebrews chapter 13, we'll finish in this section of God's word. Hebrews chapter 13 What does a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, look like? That's page 1304 if you're using a pew Bible. Hebrews 13, 
13, 14, 15, and 16. I've got four things I'm going to show you that you and I do as a living sacrifice. Hebrews 13 and verse 13 says, Let us go therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. The sacrifice of prestige. You know, when you call yourself Christian, when you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're putting yourself in a group of people that's not necessarily celebrated. I noticed that we've got a Supreme Court nominee going on right now, and one of the things they want to go after about her is her faith in Christ. That ought not to surprise you. Jesus said they're going to hate you because they hated me first. I happen to think that they hate our president because they hate you and I. Now, I'm not comparing him to Christ. That's not, you know. But the reality of it is, you and I, by association, are grouped into a group that is not liked. And Satan stokes the hate for Christians every chance he gets. You and I, as a living sacrifice, bear the reproach of being a Christian. And let me tell you something, I don't mind that one bit. I'll gladly associate myself with my Savior rather than some of the others that want supposedly are your friends or supposedly are sticking up for you. Don't you believe it for a second. Number one, a sacrifice of prestige in verse 13, bearing his reproach. Let's look at verse 14. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The sacrifice of position. You and I are pilgrims. I live at 271 Griffin Road in Levant. You can send all your checks and notes to that address if you'd like. But anyway, 271 Griffin Road in Levant is my house. I pay the taxes. The fact is, it's not my house. It belongs to the government. When I stop paying my taxes on it, the government takes it back. You really don't own anything. You're just paying rent on it. When you can't afford the rent anymore, they'll take it from you. Now, why did I say that? I don't know. I just get on these rants every now and then, but they will tell you I own that house. I guess I do, but the fact is you and I are strangers and pilgrims in this earth. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid out somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. You and I are just strangers and pilgrims. We have a sacrifice of prestige. We have a sacrifice of position. Not only that, in verse number 15, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks in his name. We have prestige, position, the sacrifice of praise. The fruit of our lips is what that is. That can be in song. That can be in conversation. Are you thankful this morning? Have you thanked God already this morning for anything in your life? I hope you have. But the sacrifice of our lips, the Bible talks about in several places. Ephesians 5.20 says, giving thanks always for all things unto God. Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good. James 1.2 says, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or tests. You know, you and I, well, we're, we're very thankful for the good times. And, and every now and then, I'll just, my brother. We never say, thank you, Jesus, without mentioning my brother Floyd. That was his favorite term, thank you, Jesus. It's just the way he was. And so a lot of times we'll say, thank you, Jesus, for the good things. But have you thanked the Lord for the bad things in your life? Oh, preacher, we can't go there. And I'll tell you what, I'm just preaching. I'm just talking here. I'm not saying I've mastered this part of it. I've thought about events in my life that have taken place already at 58 years, and I've looked at, and I, I can't honestly say, and I, I can't think of a time where I have said thank you, God, for certain events in my past. Now, I guess maybe I'm supposed to have. I just don't want you to think that, boy, that pastor, he's got this all figured out. I'm telling you, there are times in life where saying thank you is more than we're capable of doing. But the Lord asks it. What would that be called? Oh, that would be called a sacrifice, wouldn't it? Because he's asking us something that's almost harder than we can possibly do, but he wouldn't ask it if we couldn't do it. So I'm telling you, when the trials and temptations of life come, the Bible says we're supposed to offer a sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. And lastly, verse number 16, 
But to do good and to communicate, forget not, with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. And the last one is the sacrifice of our possessions. To communicate means to share. Those things that God has given you, we ought to be willing to share. I'll tell you what, we're not very good at that in America. And if your last name's Griffin, we're not very good at it either. So I'll tell you, it's hard to let go of something. That's mine. That's mine. That's our human nature. You can't have that. So, a living sacrifice. Present yourself. The prestige, the position, the praise, the possessions. Matthew 20, 27 to 28 says, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. There needs to come a time when you realize that sacrificing for Christ is the only thing that makes sense. Romans 12, 1, present yourself. I have found in 40 years of being in a position where I wanted to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, probably longer than that. I can't tell you how satisfying living for the Lord is. I've had stuff. I drive the nicest vehicles that American manufacturers have ever... I'm not bragging. I think I've got the prettiest wife. I think I've got the best... I, I think I think I have <laughs> I, I I am so incredibly blessed and I've experienced a lot of the things that people would say boy if you could just have X and honestly for the most part I've had it all that that America has to I've lived the American dream but nothing compares to living for Jesus Christ now, I'm not just saying, I just, I believe that to the very core of my being. A little hunchback boy in Sunday school had memorized some Bible verses along with all the other kids in his class. One Sunday evening, he was to come up to the front and recite the verses and then walk off the stage. One cruel youngster, seeing the hunchback boy stumbling onto the stage, yelled out, Hey, cripple! Why don't you get rid of that pack off your back? You could have heard a pin drop as the little boy stopped and just dissolved in tears. All of a sudden, a man got up and walked down the aisle and came up and stood by the boy and put his arm around him, and he said, I don't know what kind of person would say something like that, but I just want to say the most courageous person in this room today is this little boy. You see, he's my son. And I'm proud of him. With that, he reached down and picked up his son and carried him back to his seat. The world will scoff at us as ignorant, unintelligent, deformed, unloved, and uncared for. But don't you believe it. There's a God in heaven that sent his son that puts his arm around you and says, I'm proud of you. You remind me of my son. And with that, he carries you on. Our Heavenly Father, there is no sacrifice too great for the grace and mercy that we have already received. You have showered your blessings on the Cornerstone Baptist Church and on the members of it. We are privileged to be called Christian. We are privileged to know that our sins are forgiven and we have a home in heaven. For those of us that have our family with us, we are privileged to be a dad, to be a mom, to be a grandparent. Whatever our title can be claimed that would be true. We need not exaggerate about the things that we've accomplished or the people that we've met. If we've met Jesus Christ, it's greater than Donald Trump or Barack Obama or any name that we could fill in the blank with. We are somebody. Because God Almighty is our Father, and Jesus Christ 
has paid our debts. And Lord, I hope that we would just catch a glimpse of the incredible gift that we have been given in salvation and forgiveness and a home in heaven and the comfort and joy and trust that we have in you. And the least that we can do, it's a reasonable thing. It's not unre- It's a reasonable thing to present ourselves a living sacrifice. Lord, I pray that every person here, under the sound of my voice this morning, has said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior at some point in their life. And Lord, if not right now, I pray they would say, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive my sins, be my Savior. Then, Lord, for those that know you already, I pray that we would say, Lord Jesus, I present myself to you. Use my life in whatever way you want. Lord, we'll open the altar. We'll give folks a chance to respond. If we've not presented ourselves before, I pray today we would. If maybe we have in the past, but we've taken ourselves back off the altar, Lord, I pray that we'd put ourselves back in the running as a living sacrifice for you. Use this invitation, please, for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name.